Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Tonight we are going to have a look at a paper that was recently out in JAMA Surgery entitled 60-day mortality of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer randomized to systemic treatment versus primary tumor resection followed by systemic treatment, uh, which is part of the Cairo 4 phase 3 randomized clinical trial. This is a slightly shorter session uh, as the teaching session uh, will be used as part of a blog episode um, entitled An Introduction to Evidence-Based Medicine and Why uh, Is It Important? So stay tuned so you can catch up with that at some point when uh, we get it out for you. I'll leave you to it. So, um, yeah, I'm Felix. I'm a junior clinical fellow in general surgery at Huddersfield, just to introduce myself. Um, tonight, me and Gio will be talking about this uh, paper which entitled 60-day mortality of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer who are randomized to systemic treatment versus primary tumor resection followed by systemic treatment. This uh, is published as part of a wider trial called the Cairo 4 uh, clinical trial, and it's run by the Dutch colorectal cancer and Danish colorectal cancer groups, which comprises of the authors you can see there. And it was published a couple of weeks ago in this um, journal, JAMA Surgery. And the PubMed information is just there as well. Yeah. Right, so a little bit of background about the topic. Now, um, the management of colorectal cancer in patients with unresectable metastatic disease, but virtually no symptoms or minimal symptoms from the primary tumor is uh, a debated subject. Um, as things are standing, uh, and as far as I know, there is no guideline recommending primary resection um, as part of the treatment in patients that are otherwise not curable. Uh, with um, the caveat that there is not too much evidence to support this, but the feeling that the burden of morbidity that we would be adding to these patients probably doesn't justify um, the operation itself. And interestingly, um, a trial that ran pretty much in parallel to the Cairo 4, the IPAC trial, actually explored very similar um, patient population and uh, was stopped uh, early because of futility of the surgical intervention. Um, so in this context, uh, rather than um, exploring sort of the uh, role of surgery itself, uh, the authors somehow ask themselves uh, if there is a subgroup of, subgroup of patients that will potentially benefit from surgical treatment. Um, Bob, back to Felix to talk a little bit more about uh, the aims. Yeah, so the overall question they're asking is, is there a difference in 60-day mortality between systemic treatment only versus primary tumor resection followed by systemic treatment? in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer who are being treated with palliative intent. So to put that into a PICO format, the patients um, have to be 18 years or older with a WHO performance status between zero and two, uh, with a histologically confirmed, uh, radiologically resectable colorectal cancer with unresectable metastases and no severe signs or symptoms from the primary tumor. The intervention is primary tumor resection which must be performed within four weeks of randomization, which is then followed by uh, systemic treatment with bevacizumab and a fluoropyrimidine-based chemotherapy. The comparison is um, patients who only receive the systemic treatment, same systemic treatment, which must commence within four weeks of randomization. And the outcome they are measuring in this paper is 60-day mortality. Um, there are some further secondary outcomes, which we'll come on to shortly. Uh, Gia, if you want to talk about the methods. Yeah, sure. So um, as mentioned earlier on, this is an international multicenter randomized phase three trial. Um, 45 centers were involved in total between Denmark and Netherlands. 
it ran for a very long time it's from July 2012 to January 2021. So this is pretty much a 10 year span. Patients are randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to two groups um, and there's no blocks. Uh, no blinding is attempted uh, at any level. So uh, surgeons, oncologists, patients, and assessors are all not blinded to the intervention. Uh, the authors do uh, use minimization to kind of obtain um, homogeneous group um, in terms of number of metastatic sites, uh, serum LDH, WHO performance status, institutions where the patients are treated, a location of the primary tumor. Uh, the two groups, as Felix mentioned already, are systemic treatment only with uh, chemotherapy or primary tumor resection followed by systemic treatment. So um, the outcomes that the authors report about in this paper are not the outcomes that were originally described as the main outcomes of the Cairo 4 study. So the authors focused on 60-day mortality. And as a secondary outcome, they look at association between patient biochemical characteristics and 60-day mortality within each treatment arm. So basically trying to identify patients that are more likely or less likely to die uh, based on uh, patient or biochemical characteristics themselves. And they also aim at comparing adverse events, uh, which are um, sort of standardized in their recording, uh, which in the two treatment apps within 16 days of randomization. Now, if we have to be uh, a bit more exact, we would say that all of these are secondary outcomes. They were actually not planned as outcomes in the original study design. So the authors do not provide any um, sampling calculations, any um, sample size calculations, because the study is not designed specifically to look at this. And we can talk about it uh, later in more details. Uh, ball back to you, Felix. Yeah, so they recruited uh, 198 patients who were randomized into two arms, as we've described, 99 patients in each. Um, to start with the systemic treatment arm, uh, they included 99 of these patients in the intention to treat uh, analysis. Three of the patients uh, then became excluded because they needed emergency resection. Um, emergency resection. Although it's interesting to note that this was left up to the discretion of the treating center. And as we mentioned before, they included 45 centers in the study. Um, and then six, they mentioned in the paper that six uh, patients in this arm underwent primary tumor resection owing, owing to symptoms. So we can therefore only presume that three patients um, had both the systemic therapy and the primary tumor resection, but it's not something that they really elaborated on in the write-up. 96 of the 99 patients uh, received their systemic therapy within 60 days as planned. In the primary tumor resection arm, there were again 99 patients, two were excluded immediately. Um, one had no evidence of metastatic disease at initial laparoscopy, and one uh, was never actually consented to be a part of the study. And then they effectively withdrew consent immediately. So they were excluded. So 97 included in the intention to treat analysis. Of those, then seven were excluded for various reasons, which you can see there. Um, when we were reading three, we couldn't quite work out what is the difference between patients refusing to undergo surgery um, once they've been included in the intention to treat population or before. Um, and we felt that they might have uh, excluded these patients um, for essentially withdrawing their consent. 66 of the 97 patients, uh, so 68% received their systemic therapy um, within 60 days and 68 had laparoscopic procedures. These tables demonstrate the characteristics um, the salient points are on the left-hand side um, in the primary tumor resection arm. There was a male predominance in the um, in, in the study, um, and this is important uh, as the authors mentioned later on that they have um, reviewed a pooled analysis of 26 randomized control trials, which have shown men to have a worse prognosis as compared to women. Um, although they do state that this is a small difference. Um, the rest of the characteristics and parameters are well matched for patient characteristics. Um, and on the right there, you can see the um, different procedures in which in the primary tumor resection arm, which patients underwent. Um, and important to note, quite high stoma formation rate, which I think Gio will mention again later on. 
to you. Um, right, yes. Yeah. So as you can see uh, on the uh, graph on the left side, there is a clear difference between the two groups in terms of 60-day mortality. 3% um, in the systemic therapy group, 11% in the surgery followed by systemic therapy group. And this results in a statistically significant p-value of 0.03. Um, on the right side, you can see why uh, the patients that died, uh, died in each group. So in the systemic therapy group, you can see that they either died because of progression of disease or toxicity related to treatment um, or a complication related to the primary tumor, uh, such as a chronic perforation. Uh, in the uh, um, surgery first group, uh, you can see that uh, only one case was actually directly linked as a surgical complication. Um, four patients had rapid disease progression after surgery, two died even before having surgery, uh, and four died um, as after a start in systemic therapy, either as a result of toxicity from the therapy itself, or for sepsis, or for a known cause. That sepsis was not neutropenic, therefore was not put down as a complication of chemotherapy. Um, ball to you, Felix. So in the secondary outcomes, um, no patient characteristics were found to be uh, statistically significant for uh, increased 60-day mortality within either arm. That's patient uh, non-biochemical characteristics. In the systemic treatment arm, serum albumin uh, was found to be significant uh, predictor for mortality with a p-value of 0 0.04. And in the primary tumor resection arm, LDH, AST, ALT, and neutrophils were all found to be statistically significant um, predictor of 60-day mortality. Uh, they also noted that these parameters, uh, when combined, increase the risk of mortality. Uh, as Gio mentioned a bit earlier, uh, there is no mention in any of the secondary outcomes about quality of life, surgical morbidity, or progression-free survival, which did make up um, part of the initial protocol when it was published in 2014. And then the other secondary outcome was adverse events, of which none were found to be uh, statistically significant. Um, so in terms of the limitations that they reported themselves, uh, they noted the small sample size. Uh, in their initial protocol, they aimed to recruit 360 patients according to their power calculation, and they've only recruited 196 in this study. Not all patients underwent the allocated treatment as planned, um, although they say that the results were borne out in the intention to treat uh, per protocol analysis. And there was gender imbalance, uh, which they've um, commented on as well. So Gio, if you want to talk about the other limitations we observed. Yeah, just a few things that we picked up as we were going along. So um, as mentioned, the inclusion criteria interpretation is left to the um, local researcher, um, which means that different surgeons might be assessing similar patients and determining whether they are about to develop symptoms that require surgery already have symptoms that require surgery or they're unlikely to develop symptoms that require surgery, which means that some patients might be, the same patient in two different centers might be included or excluded. Um, you would uh, expect minimization to have kind of uh, made this less uh, relevant. However, there are a few patients that were excluded, uh, particularly six, because they ended up requiring um, emergency surgery uh, in the primary treatment, a primary chemotherapy treatment uh, group, uh, which makes me think that perhaps uh, um, more attention should have been given to defining who should be included and shouldn't. Um, as we already mentioned, this is not really the original randomized clinical trial we were talking about. Uh, this is a preliminary result, uh, a 60 days, uh, which was unplanned in the original uh, sort of trial protocol. Uh, of note, uh, in the original trial protocol, there is uh, an interim analysis planned. Uh, the original sample size calculations were, were sort of uh, designed to identify six months different survival in favor of surgery. Um, and uh, again, uh, the number of patients that they were supposed to recruit was 360 uh, or so. Um, the interim analysis was planned, I believe, at 60% of the uh, death events recorded. Um, so perhaps the trial was stopped, and we don't know. That's something that uh, we probably should ask the authors. Um, 
we talked about inclusion and exclusion after randomization. I found that a bit confusing because um, I felt that generally if a patient is randomized to surgery and then they say, I don't want surgery, that means that they're withdrawing consent, um, at least to me, although it's arguable. And I agree that it's a fine line, but um, there obviously will be variation between centers, but also variations within the same center in time. Uh, again, minimization should have accounted for that and protected, but uh, I would still count it as a, as a, as a limitation. Um, the sort of fifth point, I'm not entirely sure whether it's a limitation or not, actually. Um, but LDH was used both as uh, an element of the minimization protocol and also as an outcome. Shouldn't really affect you too much, but um, I'm pondering whether that does have an effect on the analysis. And obviously, I think the big elephant in the room is quality of life that is completely not talked about in this in this paper. Um, a surrogate of it could be stoma formation rate. Again, uh, having 14 stomas out of uh, about 95 operations, that obviously does affect quality of life, especially for people that do have a very short life expectancy. Um, so, Paul, back to you, Felix, for the conclusions. Uh, so, the authors concluded uh, that patients randomized to primary tumor resection followed by systemic treatment experienced higher 60 day mortality than patients randomized to systemic treatment alone. So, that was the bottom line that they concluded. And in the table there, you can see some of uh, our positive points and also criticisms of the trial, which we've already been through. Um, so, I think that brings the presentation to a close. Um, welcome any questions or comments. As usual, a brief summary of the discussion we had about the paper. Now, um, we reiterated a few points that were already made during the presentation and expanded on them. First of all, we all felt that uh, the most important thing to say about this particular report is that this is not really the Cairo 4 phase 3 randomized clinical trial, but it is a specifically unplanned analysis of arbit arbitrarily picked outcomes which is somehow considered unusual uh, given that uh, the actual results of the Cairo 4 um, clinical trial are not out there or available in any shape or form. Um, we also reiterated um, a point that the authors do mention during uh, their discussion, which is about multiple statistical testing. We discuss uh, multiple statistical testing on um, episode 19. The um, authors do say that they decided not to correct for multiple statistical testing. This wouldn't be um, unacceptable in the context of perhaps a planned analysis, but uh, given that this is completely unplanned and off the original protocol of the CARA 4 study, we feel that perhaps it would deserve a more thorough discussion in the paper itself. Also, we uh, didn't feel that uh, using LDH both for minimization and for purposes of um, potential predictor uh, would be a limitation, methodologically speaking. Overall, we felt that uh, the main issue was really the fact that the actual outcome of the trial itself are not available to us or the scientific community for what matters. And uh, the protocol that was published in 2014 becomes almost redundant in the moment you start um, writing up results based on outcomes that were not originally planned uh, as part of the analysis. And again, this is not necessarily wrong the moment you look back at your trial data and perform a secondary analysis. But the results of the, the original trial should be publicly available or at least mentioned in the paper itself. And we will highlight all of this to the authors and we'll obviously let you know. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.